have the honor and the pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Ruth Gates. She is currently the director and researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, today, she will be presenting a talk entitled Harnessing Basic Science to Advance Solutions for Coral Reefs. Here, she will unveil the complex biology that underpins this natural variation in the response of corals to stress. She will then discuss how this knowledge can be used to develop tools that build resilience on reefs. Since she attained her PhD from the University of Newcastle, she has built a dynamic and globally recognized research program that focuses on coral health. She has been an advocate for women in science, a role model to everyone she comes across, and truly a servant at heart. She has received numerous awards, including the University of Hawaii Board of Regents Medal for Excellence in Research in 2014, and Honolulu's Magazine Islander of the Year for Science in 2016. And most recently, she was featured in a film entitled Chasing Coral. It will be distributed by Netflix, and it won audience favorite at the Sundance Film Festival in August. Um, she has also served as the president of the International Society for Reef Studies and is deeply involved in saving our coral reefs. Again, it is with honor and great pleasure that I introduce to you today, Dr. Ruth Gates. Let's give her a round of applause. That's quite the introduction, and um, I'm not quite sure who that is, but I will try and live up to it. Um, as I said to the guy who mic'd me this morning, I am a walker, so forgive me as I walk around the stage and talk about this subject that is so close to my heart. So, coral reefs, we've heard it over and over and over again. They are in deep decline, and they are critically important to humans. They serve us in many ways, in food security, coastal security. Here in Hawaii, you can't talk about a coral reef without talking about the economic driver of the state, tourism. They are so important, and the number that we hear coming off the presses this year is that 50% of the world's reefs have already died. 50%. Okay, that is absolutely astonishing to me to think about. Um, and really what that means is that the intrinsic capacity of the system to adapt to the changes that are happening in the marine environment is being overwhelmed. It's as simple as that. The equation no longer works. Natural adaptation and the changes in the marine environment are disconnected. And so what we have is a situation where declines continue. We monitor the declines, we report the declines, and we think, good God almighty, it's a really, really, really serious problem. Before I talk more about the problem, I'd like to talk, to talk more about the subject and these extraordinary animals that, that really create coral reef ecosystems. So these are organisms that are ancient, they've been on the planet for over 200 million years, well over 200 million years, and they are extraordinary at leveraging the biology of other organisms. Now, I got into this field because I had an amazing lecturer, Dr. Barbara Brown, who stood up in a cold classroom at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne with the crashing, freezing waves coming onto the window and said, let me tell you about coral reefs. Well, let me not tell you about them. Let me show you pictures of these vibrant, beautiful ecosystems. And as she unveiled the complexity of coral reefs. I was fascinated by it and thought to myself, well, this is it, obviously. I, I think this is the field that I want to get into. And it was really one aspect of the biology that fascinated me. And it was really their extraordinary intimate interaction with microorganisms. So we, I was working on a model at that time, Aptasia pulchella, the fabulous model anemone. 
um, and really started to explore the biology that underpins their success, the relationship between these dinoflagellates living inside the animal cells, inside the animal cells, a plant inside an animal cell, that's incredibly crazy. To us, we're sort of every day an old hat about it right now, but really, every time I think about that, I think this is insane, that evolution has allowed this kind of interaction to evolve, and evolve over a period of 50 million years. And now what we have is a system of biology that is organism, animal, plant, it is bacteria, it is virus, it is a whole host of organisms contributing to the overall health of an individual coral. So complex and multifaceted that it's difficult to capture with the papers that say corals do X or corals do Y. This relationship has led to the diversification of enormous numbers of species of corals in different places that has led us to a point where we know that no two coral reefs across the world are the same. We know that no two corals perform the same. We know that there's such variation in the biology that it's almost impossible to be able to capture. But everything about these intimate relationships frames their enormous biological success, their capacity to produce, to photosynthesize, to unify gaseous carbon dioxide with water, to create a food molecule and oxygen that we breathe using light energy. That is the base of the food chain. Corals do it, a food factory within. They are able, as a result, to calcify and create structures that form reefs that are houses for many other organisms and structures that can in some cases be seen from space. Unbelievable biology. This is why I got into it. I was fascinated by the creature. I love it. In fact, arguably, I understand corals in unfortunate ways because of the way that I've studied them for 30 years. You know, they are so difficult to work with because they do everything unexpectedly. You think you have a great hypothesis, you test it and you absolutely reject it. You think you have a great question, well it turns out it's a null question because there's a question that came before that you haven't actually understood yet. They are complex and fabulous. And they are so complex and fabulous that they do some really unusual things that we rarely talk about in corals. And that is, even though 50% of the reef is dead, 50% is alive. And what that really reflects is enormous variation in the way in which corals respond to stress. They respond to stress in a very visually obvious way. They turn ever paler to white as they gradually re release or lose these fundamentally important dinoflagellates from within their cells and tissues, and these dinoflagellates give them their characteristic dark brown color, which, when released, allows the transparent tissues to show the skeleton that is white directly beneath. And so a bleached coral is essentially in a coral devoid of symbionts, and what you're seeing is skeleton. And as I said, they produce food for the animal, and so as the animal loses its symbionts, it starts to starve. And when it starves, it is more susceptible to death and disease and all kinds of other things that are occurring in the marine environment. But this level of variation in the organism in its response to stress is very provocative. And that level of variation manifests across all scales. You can see there on the far right left-hand side, a picture of a, a single Acropora palmata colony. It's beautiful. This is a very iconic picture taken, I think, by Andrew Baker. Um, it shows a totally bleached upper surface and a very dark brown undersurface, suggesting that the upper surface is showing extra extraordinary signs of, death, of, of, of stress, and the undersurface is healthy. Right next door to that on the right side, we see individuals in the same species exhibiting a bleaching or not exhibiting a bleaching response. Side by side on the same reef at exactly the same moment, experiencing arguably, arguably exactly the same thing. In the lower left, different species in a, in a, a reefscape here in Morea some of which are white and some of which are not, suggesting that even at the taxonomic level of species, there are big differences in the way that these individuals are responding. 
and then across the entire archipelago here I've pictured the Hawaiian Islands um, across this archipelago we had some reefs that were extremely hard hit by a bleaching event a stress event that hit in 2014 and we had some reefs that were not affected at all and really the question that has to be on everybody's mind is why why do we see this extraordinary level of variation and to me the variation is exciting because the variation is why we have corals alive today let's face it if they all were responding in exactly the same the same way all would be dead at this point well I'm gonna encapsulate here about 25 30 years of science and you know some of this has been contributed a very small proportion by myself but a lot of it is coming in from the peer-reviewed literature that has been emergent over the last 35 to 40 years. So this is a very, very heavily studied system. And what we think we know about corals and why some survive conditions that kill others is that who they are is important. I've just talked about species level differences, genetic underpinnings, taxonomy, at the population or species or above level that is all critically important in who survives um, overlaying and interacting with the base genetics of the animal is the characteristic of their partnerships who do they partner with that seems to be massively important there's been a lot of discussion about the dinoflagellates that are divided into these nine major groups that we call clades. We really didn't come up with good names when we started doing this work. I have to say, clades I, A through I don't really capture the complexity of these symbiotic dinoflagellates. Um, and just to give you an idea of how taxonomically different these clades are, they are, from a, a DNA sequence perspective, different from one another at the same level of orders of free-living dinoflagellates. So to call this an entire genus made up of nine clades that each differ from one another on a scale of orders in the free-living community seems a little bit of a stretch. And we know now that there are masses of different species and types that fall under each of these cladal designations. Some of them have been described as species, others as strains. But the piece that's most important is that who corals partner with has implications for how they will make it through a stress event. And clay D, the thermally tolerant clade, has been much in our minds because we realize that corals that harbor clay D tend not to bleach as readily as corals that harbor clay C. And these are two of the dominant groups found with sclerectinian corals. And that's a wonderful thing, that these corals harboring clay D make it through the bleaching event. But there's now questions about whether clay D is actually an opportunist, and it's actually invading a space that is sub-optimal from an immunological perspective, is compromised, and that when they really have long-term engagement with clay D, they don't do so well, because they don't get fed so well. Again, this speaks to short-term gain potentially long-term pain. It doesn't necessarily mean that just a switch at one time in your life history is going to mean that you are going to be a success story for the rest of your lives. These are important things to think about. And the last thing, which is very provocative, I think, is that we are now starting to understand, and it's not really um, that surprising, that near environmental history can have huge implications for what happens next for a coral. So a coral, there were many, many anecdotal reports that corals that had survived a disturbance, a severe bleaching disturbance, tended not to bleach as acutely when faced with a future disturbance of a similar magnitude. Now that is pretty provocative. So conditioning accomplished with environmental context is really interesting to think about as a uh, wow. So these three things come together. That, that map along the, um, uh, on, the, on the far side of your figure is actually the map of Oahu with thermal stress anomalies highlighted um, around the coastline, showing that actually 
there are many places that differ extraordinarily in the number of thermal stress anomalies or the, the number of times that the, the temperature has exceeded a degree above normal for a week um, around the island of Oahu. And there's a great gradient on the north coast there where we find corals and work with corals. That is extraordinary from relatively few to many. And so there is this very dynamic context that we find reefs in at local scales that we almost never talk about when we look at, say, the um, bleaching indices that are produced by NOAA. There are things going on at the local scale that we have not yet really got a handle on. And these are all sensed at sort of a, a four kilometer pixel size, but what would happen if we put a temperature sensor right next to a coral? How dynamic an environment would we see? And how would that vary over space? So, And when you look at this literature, what you see at the end of most of these papers is this statement. I've written it myself. I have heard, I've read it literally hundreds of times in peer-reviewed papers and proposals. And this work is directly relevant to the conservation and management of coral reefs. I went on sabbatical in 2010, and I sat down and I thought, and this work has no relevance to the conservation and management of coral reefs. Because I'm a basic scientist, assuming I understand what is relevant to the conservation and management of coral reefs. But I don't even know what we're trying to conserve or preserve. I don't know what the benchmarks are. I don't know how decisions are made. I don't understand anything about what I'm now using to justify all of my existence as it pertains to reefs. Because every coral reef scientist in the world, including myself, is deeply committed to seeing coral reefs survive. We just don't know how to contribute to that agenda. We know we've got information that's of value, but are we really using it in an appropriate way? And so it was really then that I started thinking much more about my own desire to help and my inability really to do that because I was confined to the academic discipline. And it began a journey for me that has been, you know, a five, six, seven year journey of extraordinary learning. And I thought the best thing to do is to work out how to do this by talking to people about how they do that. So how do you manage and how do you conserve? And I realized we're speaking different languages. 95% conf confidence, a manager and conservation professional would say to me, I don't have time for a 95% confidence. If you've got a good idea that you think will work, Share it with me so I can think about how it might apply in a situation where I have literally 10 days to make a decision. So this was the beginning of something really interesting. It made me realize we don't talk enough. We don't have enough crosstalk. We don't understand each other. Vocabulary, we are separated in time. So then the challenge is for us on coral reefs to really do what we know needs to be done from our basic science, which is to close this huge gap between the rates of adaptation on reefs and the rates of change in the environment. That's the challenge. Is it enough to designate a marine protected area, to put a boundary around an area and hope that it will be fine moving forward? Does any of our current data suggest that reefs globally have the capacity to survive the 1.5 to 2 degree rise in temperature that is coming down the pipe, and that we know is coming down the pipe with the best case scenario for mitigating the climate change drivers. Well, that was the question that I grappled with and my community grappled with. In fact, coming up to COP22, our society put together a consensus statement for COP22 to advance the agenda of mitigation that said, if we continue business as usual, the majority of the world's reefs will be dead in 2050. We use the term massively degraded to avoid the inevitable 
Twitter in the background of, well, some corals will survive, some corals will survive. There will be one or two survivors. There will be one or two survivors, but the reefs as we know them, the majority of the reefs as we know them, will die in 37 years. In our lifetime. Well, for me, as a scientist who studied these things, is fascinated by them, that is completely unacceptable. It is completely unacceptable to lay down and die and say, I'm going to monitor this situation. And so decided that we had to think about harnessing our biology. How do we take our knowledge forward? How do we capitalize on this variation? And so myself and the fabulous Madeleine Van Oppen from the Australian Institute of Marine Science started talking in detail about how do we do this? How do we harness this biology? What would we do? And obviously the thing to do is to do what nature does, but to accelerate it. To try and push the biology so that it can keep up. We need to close that gap. How do we do that? And so we decided to take the the position that we needed to assist the biology to, to do what is called assisted evolution, to accelerate natural processes by mechanisms that have been used extensively in terrestrial places. In fact, any of you who've had breakfast or own a domestic animal are working with an assisted evolution situation, right? So, we said, why don't we, if we know that the base genetics of the system are important and we know that there are some survivors, why don't we just breed the survivors? Why don't we target breeding? Why do we leave it to chance? If we leave it to chance and to nature, perhaps nature will actually randomly select two gametes that come from hyper-successfully performing corals, but the majority may not. And if we know that the symbiosis, the intimate interactions between corals and microorganisms are so influential to outcomes in terms of their health, why not manipulate that system? Why not look for the best partnerships and why not engineer for them? And if we know that environmental history is critical to a future ability to withstand stress. If you survive something and it doesn't kill you, are you better able to face it in the future? Why don't we challenge corals to be their very best? Why don't we treat them like super athletes, exercise them? And this is why this project became the Super Coral Project, right? It was hilarious because I analogized to the fact that what we were doing is just what we do with our super athletes. We go out into the environment, we pick the best performers, we bring them into a gym, we run them on a treadmill, we feed them a great diet, and at the end they often meet a partner in that same environment and they have offspring that are super, super athletes. So it was a great analogy to get people to understand it, right? But, but the, the, the reality is it's, 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 it's a complete turn in the way that we're thinking about the system. It's a complete, uh, uh, it's an emotional shift in our thinking about reefs. Can nature really be natural on its own? That was the question that we really posed. And at about the same time as we were posing this, Paul Allen, who's a co-founder of Microsoft, put out a challenge to the community, the marine community, saying, give us your best ideas for mitigating the impacts of ocean acidification in marine systems. And so Madeline and I thought, this is a great opportunity. We'll just write a 2,000 word essay and we'll submit it to the competition. Of course, it's not gonna get anywhere because really why would it, but who else is gonna fund this kind of proof of concept work? And much to our surprise, it did win. Um, and we were invited to put a full proposal into the Allen Foundation, and it took us a long time to move it through to, to funding, but we are in the midst of a project that is really doing proof of concept work to ask whether we can do these three things, and um, the answer is we can. We can do some of these things. Now, what does it mean is a whole other question, but our first task is to demonstrate that we can selectively breed a coral, which may sound really easy. We've done it with all our domestic animals, all our food. You know, I mean, we're really good at selective breeding, let's face it. But the reality is corals are extremely difficult 
to work with from a reproductive uh, perspective because they are like stopwatches. They reproduce different species on one or two nights a year, perhaps in two months of the year. So capturing them, and of course they always do that at night, which is really, really uh, unfortunate if you're a biologist who wants to capture them doing that in the wild. Um, so just the very logistics of capturing the eggs and sperm is, is quite difficult. And of course, the base problem is, who are the strongest performers? And I wish that we'd had to do the experiments that would allow us to actually identify those artificially. But actually, nature and climate change did it for us. We have had back-to-back -back bleaching events in Hawaii, unprecedented scale, in 2014 and 2015. And as we launched the project in 2015, in June of 2015, we had the most extensive bleaching event to date. And what that enabled us to do was to go out onto the reef and label tons of corals at the height of the bleaching, corals that we knew were bleached and corals that we knew were not. And so we had this great map of the best and the worst performers, and we have been able to leverage that to collect those individuals and work with the strongest and the weakest to selectively breed them successfully um, in the last year. That is extremely exciting. So the answer to the question, can we selectively breed, could we target the genetics and direct it? The answer is yes. The modification of the symbiosis. Look, I have been studying this symbiosis for almost 30 years, and it is not trivial to modify, certainly, the dinoflagellate symbioses. In 85% of the corals have to reinvigorate their symbiosis anew every generation. So they have to acquire them from the outside. It is a hor horizontal transmission mechanism. Um, and they always do that as babies, as the free-swimming um, or new, newly settled coral polyps. In Hawaii, almost all our corals in the latter 15%, they are vertically transmitted from parent generation to offspring. They are incredibly tuned symbioses. They tend to be very low diversity and very inflexible. And so right now, I have an amazing student who's attempting to do the experiments to see whether we can even open a window to get adult corals to take up new symbionts. And it is looking potentially like there is a developmental window when a coral might be entrepreneurial about who it partners with, but that that could close. And the opportunity for adults to take up new types of symbionts is extremely, extremely small. That is new types of symbionts that actually interact with it in a beneficial and mutually beneficial way. Are there opportunities for the corals to be infected by potentially parasitic or opportunistic symbiont types if they are unhealthy in the face of an environmental disturbance? We think the answer to that question is yes. And so the increase in pathogenicity and opportunism in the system and shifting away from these highly refined and sophisticated long-term interactions looks like there could happen. Um, but there's many other partners, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, and that is the partnerships between the microbes and the corals. And just like we're learning for human health, the microbial consortia are critical to the health of corals. And so the question as to whether we could, say, drip the mucus that contains most of the bacteria from a healthy coral onto a bleached coral and see some shift in the overall prognosis for that individual is something that we're playing with right now and is kind of fun to do. It's a very low technology solution to a very big problem because actually in nature, corals are sloughing their, mu their mucus all the time and depending on the conditions, there is opportunity for this to happen naturally. Again, the question is could we direct that?
And lastly, this um, rapid adaptation thing, the I've had an experience, it didn't kill me, I am now stronger, and it's within my experience envelope, and so when I see it the next time, I'm just gonna say it's normal. And I was laughing earlier about the first time I gave a presentation, I thought I was gonna fall off the stage with nervousness, and you know, many years later, I still have that moment of nervousness for the first couple of minutes of the talk, and then I settle into it and I'm okay. I, it is within my experience envelope now. So I have become inured to the condition that is challenging me in that moment. And we think that corals are doing this. And so the question is, can we artificially induce those experiences? And one of my postdocs spoke yesterday about a very large reciprocal transplant experiment where we've moved corals around Kaneohe Bay from and to reefs that differ in their environmental context in subtle ways. And we have a whole program of work that is exposing corals in the laboratory to simulated future ocean conditions, warmer and more acidic, in the hope that they will induce a change in the way that they perceive those when we give them those conditions a second time. And not only will they have greater capacity to face the future, but their offspring then could potentially acquire that skill from their parents through transgenerational acclimatization. And my PhD student, Holly Putnam, did some of the first work on transgenerational acclimatization um, as part of her thesis in 2012. And we've published work suggesting that, yep, corals that are exposed to simulated future conditions produce offspring that are different from those that are exposed to ambient conditions. The question is, what do those differences mean? And of course, because corals are relatively slow growing, we have to wait to find the answer to that question. We have to wait until they're big enough to now put through a second challenge and ask whether those differences that appear in their physiology early in development actually provide a positive, negative, or neutral outcome when facing a future stress. So, you know, this work really exploits extraordinary capacity um, that exists in the two locations that we're working at. So we tailored the project to really leverage it, the differences between our sites. We had many similarities. We had corals. We here in Hawaii have corals right outside our back door. We can do work 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. I use the we pretty loosely there. Um, in the Great Barrier Reef, most of the corals are collected on collecting trips and brought into the lab. And the lab in this case is the astonishing National Sea Simulator, the $50 million facility that has been developed by the Australian government as an environmental challenge facility. It, it, it has room upon room of aquaria of different sizes that can be used and exquisitely controlled to simulate future ocean. In Hawaii, we can do those experiments, but we do those experiments outside in, in, in a much raw environment. We can get great control on the environment, but we have natural light, and actually we're using seawater that is being pumped straight off the reef. So we are trying to keep them, whatever we're doing in our lab, as close to what they see in the marine setting and very close to where they come from. The biology that we're working with, we're not working with one species or two species. We are trying to work with, in Hawaii, all five species that are dominant in the ecosystem in Kaneohe Bay and around Oahu, the southern end of the chain. Montibra capitata is one of the most dominant, as is Porites compressor. Those species don't exist in Australia, and so there are species in Australia that are ecologically important, that are the focus of much of the work in Australia. But we both have Porites, sorry, Postolopora meandrina and Postolopora damacornis and Porites lutea lobata. And so we are doing companion work, looking at how we can modify the thresholds of corals of the same taxonomic group across large space. And obviously, this is hugely relevant to how we would move the agenda forward, because it's important that we are encompassing 
what I think is this large species diversity that can be collapsed into many fewer functional groups. And what we need to understand is not the specific nuances that separate the species, but the things that group them together in large groupings that would enable us to distribute the information that we're getting from our work across space to other people who could assess which functional groups are of most important in, in their place. And so we specifically ask the question with our study, is it better to do the work inside or outside? Do the corals do better in rarefied seawater or in raw seawater? How do they grow in raw versus rarefied? And actually, we think they grow better in the rarefied setting. So these are all important questions that are absolutely critical to understanding how to move forward if we are able to do some proof of concept work. So, I think the thing about this project that I really want to, to highlight is it's a shift for me. I'm a basic scientist thinking about using the science to go into a much more actionable solution set. Um, and the reason for that is because I think it's an urgent timeline that we're facing. Urgent timeline. That means we have to do things differently. And you know, it's so interesting. We, you know, we are in this big debate about mitigation of the fossil fuel burning. And we are saying everybody needs to change the way do, they do business. And yet science and scientists continue to do business as usual. And so this project, because it's timeline focused, um, because the outcome of the project is not a guarantee, we don't know whether or not we can accomplish it we don't know whether we can breed super corals, create corals that could face and, and live through what we know is going to be a much warmer and more acidic future. It is uncertain times. We feel that it's critical that the whole project has this perspective of purpose, timeline, transparency, disciplinary interactions, bringing people in who do the things that we don't do rather than trying to train ourselves quickly to get to the place we want to be. We're talking about all of our failures. Scientists never talk about their failures. That means I've seen the same experiment in my lifetime done 25 times, and it is redundant from a funding perspective to see those experiments done over and over again, and nobody wants to talk about that. But I think we must start admitting when the experiments do not work because that will really help us accelerate the timeline of science in every discipline. And we must start looking at the products in much more realistic ways. I see these peer reviews that are killing our field. They're stopping us. We're so slow to get papers out the door because we're talking about the last 2%. And in fact, I was really um, struck at the last International Coral Reef Symposium because we all agree about the 95%. But we're arguing about this last 5%, and the press picks up the last 5% and say the science in coral reefs doesn't agree. It's the people don't agree with one another. We do agree, but we just have this tiny piece where we're still debating. And the tiny piece is being aired because we have massive capacity to air across uh, much space now with social media. And I think the thing that's really unusual about this project also is the deep commitment to outreach and education. We are talking about the need, the work, the ideas, the fact that we don't know what we're doing in some cases and we do in others, and we're looking for partnerships everywhere all the time. Everybody from my undergraduate interns all the way up to my most senior people in the lab are speaking loudly and boldly and proudly about the project because they feel like they're doing something. We have been criticized up the yin-yangs for this project. You know, the Gates Lab has kind of crossed over to the other side. They're going to become, you know, a, a much more sort of, you know, a less scientifically rigorous lab, right? As if applied work is somehow inferior, right? So, I mean, that is really a problem. We perceive, oh, basic science applied. Well, 
The best thing is to have a continuation between the basic science and the applied, and the best outcome is to have the basic scientists informing any work that will go uh, 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 to an applied context all the way through the applied context, because you have the best way of retaining your science through to implementation. There is no hierarchy here. We have got to act, and it's not going to be through basic science that reefs get saved. It's going to be through the interaction of basic science and the managers and the conservation professionals. All of these problems that have been identified are all valid. Every single one of the criticisms that come to us have to be considered, they have to be thought at. That's the process of science. We're not trying to convince people we can, we're asking the question whether we can. And the evidence alone will dictate whether or not we can, whether we can advance this agenda, not the ego, not the ego, not the attachment to the answer, yes. Evidence will dictate whether we go there. And so then to the million dollar question that has been probably the most paralyzing question or has been thrown at me many, many times. Is it scalable? I say yes. Is it scalable by me? Absolutely not. I don't scale things for a living. I do basic science and I collaborate with people who have different skills and capacity that can help to do the next part. There are people who scale for a living. Who would have thought we could feed the planet? It doesn't seem that is scalable either, but apparently it is. Whether we like the way it's being scaled is irrelevant. We have food. And if food is the most important thing, it's scalable. If reefs are the most important thing, we will work out a way to scale. But it will absolutely require some really, really difficult thinking about how and where and why we choose to think about intervening on some, not all reefs. Because really, is it feasible to think about intervening, using these approaches on the Great Barrier Reef? Possibly not all of it, but maybe some of it. Already, we are talking with the agencies about how this would work. And, you know, I had a meeting in Australia with Madeline and a group of other people in terrestrial systems who have pushed the system way further before they have begun to ask these questions. And the take home was this. We wish we'd intervened earlier. We wished we'd worked on species that were still ecologically important. If we'd done that, the intervention would have been less riskier, it would have been cheaper, and it would have been more sustainable. And I think, for me, I'm all about the let's not wait until we have endangered species and only work on endangered species before we activate to do something different. And that is the intent of this project. But to actually implement will take enormous collaboration between networks of very, very differently skilled people. And our science is just one step along that way. So I'm just gonna close by saying, obviously our goal is to develop capacity that can withstand climate change stress on reefs, to sustain reefs through this moment in time before we all get our acts together and stop burning fossil fuels and driving climate change. If we don't mitigate fossil fuel burning, there will, on the long term, be no reefs. These are strategies to sustain reefs until we can stabilize the planetary temperature. If we do not mitigate, there will be no reefs to stabilize on the long term. Nothing will prevent the massive degradation of the system. But I would argue by the time that coral reefs are degrading at that level, the human race will be deeply threatened by the same things that are causing acute problems on reefs. And so maybe our concerns will be about our own survival as a species rather than the survival 
of our natural ecosystem. Because really, when we step back from the edge and think about our science right now and what is at stake, there is a lot at stake if we do nothing at this point. And so I'm going to close right there um, with these acknowledgments and say, I, this, this work is obviously, as you can see, bounded by the work of many, many other people and um, has really many of the ideas being developed in discussion with large groups of people. I can't possibly put them all up, but really I have to say that for me, collaboration is everything. I, I know a little bit about something, and when I put it together with other people who know a little bit about something else, the sum of that activity is extraordinary. I think people can do anything. We just have to stop waiting for permission. Thank you. Ruth. I, we are really short on time. I think we could probably take one question and then Ruth will be here if you would like to come up and have any kind of a discussion with her after that. Do we have somebody in the audience who wants to walk up to the mic and ask a question? Can I ask a question from here? All right. Yeah. Have you looked at endolithic fungi and bacteria which cause bioerosion of corals both shells, both dead and alive? Yes, there's a lot of endolithic, um, endolithics in the system. And in fact, the sort of fungal, the fungal world is just evolving in corals right now. There was, up until about 10 years ago, almost no literature on fungi. But somebody recently did a study in Kaneohe Bay where they show that something like 80% of the corals are infected by fungi. And there's been these really interesting pieces of work that shows when in some corals that are infected by the endolithic algae, when you bleach them and they lose their microalgal partners, that the endolithic algae actually contribute nutrition to the coral. They have enough light coming through the tissues because they're under that particular surface in the skeleton and can now produce photosynthate that can be used by the animals. So that this, this is extraordinary cascade. It's almost like an intertidal succession of what happens when a coral dies. There are many phenomena that are sort of the last rafts, I think, for the coral before they then die and become infected by microalgae and macroalgae that overgrow them. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, my studies on bioerosion says we've got five to 10 years left not 30. That is incredibly depressing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that means that we're going to have to work a lot more quickly. But I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> Thank you. OK, can I ask that we give Ruth one last round of applause? <laughs> and uh, head off to the morning session. Thank you all very much.